It was once said that communism has no history. Communism has a criminal record. And you have heard about many of the crimes of communism. You have heard about the gulags in Soviet Union. You have heard about the horror and the famines in Mao's China. You have heard about the misery wherever these ideas have been tried. But there is one element of communism evil that many of you might have not heard of. I didn't know about it, although in some way I participated in that evil in my youth. I'm talking about the war waged by communist countries, by the communist movement, and by radical leftists in general against Israel. I'm talking about the material and moral support that communist countries and radical leftists have been given to all sorts of enemies of Israel, from Arab dictatorships to Palestinian guerrillas to anti-Israeli Western Europe terrorists. The left's long war on Israel is a fascinating but mostly unknown story, a story of hate and a story of destruction. But it is also a very didactic story, and it's a story which is didactic not only for the student of history and not only for someone who is interested in Middle East affairs. Actually, it's not even a story only about the past. It's a story that can also teach us things about the present. Because it can teach us what the left is really about. It can teach us what is the character, what is the identity, what is the DNA of the left. So before we embark into this journey of blood and this journey of horror, I want to give you a two minutes maybe three, crash course on the history of Israel. So that those of you who are not familiar with the historical context, you will still be able to follow the lecture. We, will we could start from before Christ, but we will start from 1947. We are after the Second World War. We're after the Holocaust. So it becomes finally understood that the Jews need their own country. The problem is that there is one piece of land claimed by both the Arabs and the Jews. So the United Nations in 1947 comes up with a partition plan. It says the Jews will take this area here on the beach and this area here, which is mostly desert, and the rest will go to the Arabs. Notice now that the Arabs have already got Jordan and there are something like 20 Arab states in the area. So Israel, the Jews are given less than they were promised, but they say, we will take the deal. How do the Arabs react? The day in 1948 that Israel declares its independence, five Arab armies attack Israel with one goal, to obliterate it. The goal is not, not to give any land to the Palestinians. The goal is to throw the Jews to the sea. This is why whatever the Arab countries can grasp, as for, example, oops, as for example, here, the West Bank or the Gaza, they keep it for themselves. In this war, Israel hasn't even got a proper army as we know it today. It hasn't even got an air force, but it manages to survive. It manages to win, but with heavy losses. One percent of the population of Israel dies in the War of Independence in 1948. This includes people who had escaped the concentration camps, people who still had the number tattooed in their hand. They escaped one mortal enemy to find another one. But Israel manages to prevail, and actually is slightly bigger than the partition plant said. In the 1950s, the big story is that the Arabs organized themselves under a big idea, the idea of pan-Arabism. To put it simply, this means that all Arabs unite in one nation, and this nation has one goal, to throw the Jews to the sea. Why? So that there is geographical continuity among all the Arab states. The ideology of Arab nationalism is something between socialism, fascism, 
and nationalism. And its most prominent representative is Nasser, the president of Egypt. And Nasser finds a patron. This patron is Soviet Union. This patron is the new leader of Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev. So Nasser gets too self-confident and too cocky, and actually in 1956 nationalizes the Suez Canal, which, to put it simply, is an act of war against Israel. Israel immediately punishes him militarily by conquering Suez, but the West is too afraid to peace of the Arabs, is too afraid also to peace of Soviet Union. So they tell to Israel, go back. And Nasser promises, I promise I'll never do something again, and uh, Sinai will be demilitarized. Of course, he was lying. So, 10 years pass, now the Arabs are more confident because of the Soviet help, and they go for round two. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and coming from the back, Iraq and Saudi Arabia, pledge that it's time again to throw the Jews to the sea. But Israel, with a preemptive strike in what today is known as the Six-Day War, manages to defeat them. Not only manages to defeat them, Israel is tripling its size. And Israel gets a nice buffer zone here on the south, the Sinai Desert, and it gets a nice buffer zone also here with the West Bank. And they also get the Golan Heights. To put it simply, not to bore you with technical details, after 1967, the Israeli looks down to its enemies. Israel has the high ground. Not only the moral high ground, literally the high ground. So the Arabs start realizing we are, never, we are not going to throw the Jews to the sea. However, flooded with Soviet help, they try once more. They try once more in 1973 in the Yom Kippur War. Again, they fail. So, what is the situation today? What has been the situation since then? So, one big development is that Israel has done peace with uh, Egypt, so the Sinai is given back to Egypt. And the other big development is that Israel is not facing so much the military aggression from the outside, but from the inside. From Arabs that had to leave in 1948, and from Arabs living in the West Bank and in Gaza, as we know them today from the Palestinians. So today, Israel has returned Gaza, which is 100% into Palestinian control, today controlled by the Islamists of Hamas, and here in the West Bank, there is Israeli uh, military present, but administrative control by the PLO. So this is the very, 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 very short story. Something important to consider. Throughout all these existential threats, Israel has managed to maintain its identity as a country that respects basic individual rights. Israel is basically a free country, a country with rule of law. With weaknesses, the military draft is one example, but it's a country that is mostly free country. We cannot say the same about the Arabs. The Arabs keep falling from one type of authoritarianism to the other. Monarchy, Arab nationalism, Marxist-Leninism, Jihadism, Islamism. So, we have the background. So let's get back to our story. What has been the role of the left into this titanic struggle? We will start from 1967. Now, 1967 is a defeat for the Arabs that is very difficult to swallow. Remember, they were preparing to throw the Jews to the sea, and instead, Israel triples its size. But this is not only a defeat for the Arabs. This is a huge defeat for the prestige of Soviet Union. Imagine you have some, a patron state, and this patron state humiliates itself. So immediately after the end of the Six-Day War, Soviet Union says, never again, our clients, will never going to be humiliated again. So they double down their support to the Arabs. They send some of their best personnel. They send decorated marshals, their best military experts. And they send 75,000 
tons of military support. It's difficult to imagine what is 75,000 tons, so imagine three cargo ships, the ones that are the size of a neighborhood, with guns, with rockets, with supersonic jets, and with tanks. The goal, all of these, should be aimed against Israel. The Arabs make use of this help very quickly. So from 1969 to 1970, we have the so-called War of Attrition, which is low-level battles between the Arabs and the Israelis, mostly because the Arabs want to get familiar with the Soviet technology to prepare the next round. During that time, 20,000, at least 20,000, Soviet personnel serves in Egypt. Soldiers, experts, special forces, and pilots. Actually, in 1970, Soviet pilots get in direct confrontation, in dogfights, with Israeli pilots. Today, if you visit outside Moscow, the Air Force Russian Museum, you will find an Israeli helmet. This is the helmet of the pilot in the first Phantom, the American airplane that the Israelis were using, the first Phantom that the Russians, that the Soviets took down. So being confident again from this Soviet help, in 1973, the devastated six years ago Egyptian and Sierra army now is confident again to attack Israel. Israel manages to survive, but with very, very heavy losses. So the takeaway of this period is, in its battles for survival, Israel did not only face the Arab countries. Israel also faced the Soviet Union. Israel also faced its allies. Now, one could pause me here and say, OK, Nikos, who cares? So we already know Soviet Union is bad. We already know this was the Cold War period, and weird things were happening in Cold War. And also, the Soviet Union is not the same as the left. Not every left is agreed and sanctioned Soviet Union. Therefore, there's nothing to see here. I would say not so fast. There is something to see here. First of all, the support of the Soviets to the Arab regimes saw us the complete disdain that the Soviets had for any form of morality. Not only a disdain of morality for their enemies, but also for their supporters. Because while the Soviets were supporting Nasser and Syria and Iraq, the communists within Egypt, Syria and Iraq were perishing in torture chambers. Imagine that. You're a communist, you have your life taken away from you, one torture uh, session at a time, and you know that the people who support your torturers is the country that you look up to. The other interesting thing, though, is that it was, only, it was not only a Cold War kind of balance, let's support the Arabs, there are many of them, the reason why the left supported the Arabs. Because it was not only Soviet Union. Other communist countries that were antithetical to Soviet Union's Cold War aims also supported the Arabs. Mao's China, which at that time was almost in war relations with Soviet Union, supported the Arabs. Tito's Yugoslavia, supposedly an independent kind of state, also supported the Arabs. And here's the most shocking thing. Even the new left in the West, the new left that supposedly rose as a reaction to the immorality of Soviet Union, as a reaction to the cynicism of Soviet Union, even the Western New Left supported the Arabs. And when did this happen? After 1967. After 1967 is the time when more and more leftists in the West get interested about the Middle East conflict. And since the Western public opinion, since the Western idealistic youth becomes an interested party in this conflict, the character of this conflict changes completely. Because the Arabs change the narrative. The narrative is not anymore the Arab states trying to throw the Jews to the sea. The narrative now 
is that you have mighty Israel oppressing a persecuted minority, a group of people who have lost their homes, who have lost their land, and are trying to seek justice. This group of people is the Palestinians. The way the Palestinians are presented is they are the small villagers with a rifle fighting a mighty opponent. We're in the 1960s. Does this remind you any other story? Vietnam. Remember, this was a time that the public opinion in the West is captured, is fascinated by the image of the heroic Viet Cong with a rifle fighting an empire. So the left sees the Palestinians exactly like this. We don't have anymore a sea of Arab states fighting a small Israel. What we now have is the mighty Israel, the Goliath, fighting the David, the Palestinians. This David, his weapon of choice was not the slint and the rock. The weapon of choice of the Palestinians was unorthodox warfare. Their method of war was terrorism. Today, mo most of us think that terrorism is the legacy of Islamic, of Islamic movements. We think that the hijackings, the blowing up of innocents, taking hostages and shooting them, we think this is the legacy of radical Islam. And yet this is not the case. This is the legacy of Marxist-Leninist within the Palestinian movement and of Marxist-Leninist in Europe supporting the Palestinian movement. Actually, a KGB general, a guy called Alexander Sakharovsky, boasts that he was the first one who came up with the idea of hijacking airplanes, and he passed the know-how to his Arab friends. The leader of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the most active and the most, uh, the most dangerous leftist Palestinian organization, once said, to kill a Jew away from battle has more effect than killing a hundred Jews in battle. Do you get it? To kill one Jew away from battle, which means to kill civilians, has more effect than killing Jews in battle. So we cannot throw the Jews to the sea, so the new tactic is we're going to break their morale. One terrorist attack by one terrorist attack. So in its terror war against Israel, the terrorist attack were organized, perpetrated, and sanctioned, and whitewashed by the international left. I could give a hundred examples, I will just give three that are particularly horrific and particularly memorable. In 1974, we have the Malot Massacre. Malot is a town in the north of Israel. Three Palestinian terrorists occupy a school and machine gun 22 children at point blank. 22 children. And to be sure that the work is done, they also throw a grenade to them. Who were these three Palestinians? They were members of the Democratic Front for Palestine, a leftist group with very strong ties in communist countries. And even after the massacre, this group was treated in the communist countries like celebrities. In 1972, we have the massacre in, Israel, in Tel Aviv airport, one of the worst terrorist attacks in the history of Israel, organized by, the, by a faction of the Popular Front and perpetrated by three Japanese terrorists. Japanese com terrorists. What would the Japanese do in the Middle East? Well, these Japanese were members of a group called Japanese Red Army. They were Japanese communists. If you were a leftist, if you were a communist, no matter whether you are in Latin America, in Japan, in Africa, in Europe, the war against Israel is your war. 1976, we have a hijacking of an airplane leaving Tel Aviv, organized again by a fraction of the Popular Front, and Part of the hijacking were some West German radical leftists, the revolutionary cells. Notice the symbolism. 
First time after the Second World War, you have Germans pointing their guns to Jews, merely for being Jews. But this time, they're not Gestapo officers. This time, they're not SS. This time, they're German leftists. The question that rises here is, how can people who machine gun children at point blank and who blow up airplanes and hijack airplanes, how can these people be presented as the good guys? How can, this be peop how can it be that these people have the image of the freedom fighter? Where if you're a popular front and you have the whole propaganda mechanism of the international left by your side, you can literally get away with murder. Since 1967, Israel has experienced the equivalent of three 9-11s. This would never have happened without the support, moral and material support of the left. So the big question here is, why? Why does the left have such a hate for Israel? And why does the left have such a support for the Arabs? Because if you think about it, the leftist siding with the Arabs should raise your eyebrows. Because what are the professed values of the left? Democracy, secularism, workers' rights, and with the new left, women's rights and diversity. Where are you more probable to find these things? In Israel, in, the, in Israel of the kibbutzis, the communal property, in Israel that had a quasi-socialist economy for big parts of its existence, in Israel where the trade union is one of the strongest institutional places, uh, players in the country, in Israel that has the only and obviously biggest gay pride in the Middle East, in Israel that had the first female prime minister in the Western world, or in the Arab regimes of the torture chambers, of the dictatorships, where minority rights and women's rights are a joke, and where workers' mobilizations are met with tanks and real bullets. So the left support for the Arabs cannot be because of political alliance. Could it be that it's because the left is anti-Semitic? This is a very popular explanation. I think no. And here's a very simple thought experiment. If Israel was not a Jewish state, if Israel was a Christian state, do you think the left would have any different approach to the Arab-Israeli conflict? I think not. So if we want to understand the left's loathing of Israel, and if we want to understand the left's support for the Arabs, we need to move beyond politics. And we need to find ourselves at the field of morality. Because remember, when do most of the left turn their back to Israel? In 1967, when Israel triples its size and when Israel becomes stronger. This gives us a prism to understand what is happening. And what is happening has been explained by my colleague Elan Giurno, who talked about the underdog principle. The underdog principle. What does the underdog principle mean? It means that in a conflict, we always support the weakest, neediest, most suffering side. No further question asked. When Israel was weak, Israel was tolerated. Now that Israel is strong, and definitely stronger than the Palestinians, Israel is loaded. And actually, if you think about what is today's most dominant morality, you can understand a lot about the conflict in the Middle East and how not only the left, but Western public opinion approaches it. Israel is the startup nation. Israeli culture is about creating, about business, entrepreneurship. There are shopping centers, there are nightclubs. Are these moral endeavors? At best, they can be tolerated, but definitely they're not virtues. But what about the Palestinian? The Palestinian is weak, 
and the Palestinian is willing to die for something bigger than himself. Now, this something bigger than himself could be an authoritarian regime or could be a theocracy, but who cares? He's weak, he's willing to die for something bigger than himself, we support him, no more questions asked. This underdog principle then can partly explain the left support for Israel, but not fully. Because remember, many leftists and many communists were supporting Israel even before 1967. There were no occupied territories then, there was no wall, there was no, quote, apartheid, there was nothing. So here's my hypothesis. Could it be that many on the left support the Arabs against Israel out of envy for Israel? What is envy? Envy would mean my concern is not for the Palestinians to do better, my concern is not for the Palestinians to be more well-off. My concern is for Israel to be worse off for its own sake. Now, that's a very heavy accusation. How can I say something like that? Well, I can say something like that because I observe. I observe what type of people in the Middle East are the left is supporting. Dictators, theocrats, and then I ask myself, could someone who really care about the Palestinians support Nasser? Can you really care about the Palestinians and want them to be ruled by the theocrats of Hamas? So let's hear from one very prominent leftist, one of the most prominent leftists that we have these days, Jeremy Corbyn. This guy almost became prime minister of the UK. This guy aroused an enthusiasm in the left that was unprecedented for decades. And this is a statement from 13, 14 years ago, not from the 60s. So let's hear what Jeremy Corbyn has to say. Tomorrow evening, he's speaking about an event he's organizing. Tomorrow evening, it will be my pleasure and my honor to host an event in Parliament where our friends from Hezbollah, our friends from Hezbollah, will be speaking. I've also invited friends from Hamas, friends from Hamas, to come and speak as well. An organization that is dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region. For me, this statement is very revealing. Corbyn is someone who knows the Middle East very well. He's been there many times. He's been the guest of Hamas and Hezbollah. He knows what Hamas and Hezbollah are about. Hamas and Hezbollah are groups that look up to Iran's Khomeini as their model society. I mean, literally, in the rooms they have the supreme leader of Iran, they recognize him as their leader. How can you really care about the Palestinians and support these people? You cannot care for the Palestinians and love Hamas at the same time. You cannot care about the well-being of the Palestinians and call Hezbollah your friends. He knows what Hamas and Hezbollah are good at. They're good at destruction, they're good at misery, and they're good at bringing subjugation. And he doesn't care. So no, I don't think such people are motivated by solidarity for the Palestinians. I care for the unjustly suffering Palestinians. I don't think they do. I think they're motivated by envy. I want to finish with a thought about Israel. What would it take for Israel to appease the left? What would it take for Israel to persuade the left Look, we're not as bad as you think. Please tolerate us. Please let us be. For the left to tolerate Israel, one thing should happen. Israel to become more equal with the Palestinians, more equal with the Arabs. There are two ways to make Israel more equal with the Arabs. One way is for the Arabs to become more well-off. One way is for Arabs 
to get on board the ideas of uh, freedom, the ideas of, of capitalism, the ideas that, make, that made Israel the stronger part. Of course, the left would never accept that. But also, there's another way Israel could become more equal with the Arabs. And that would be Israel amputating itself. So here's an example of what the left would consider a fair solution to the conflict. Let's see the first and balanced and compromise solution. So we've heard it many times, the left saying the Israelis should stop the blockade of Gaza. Again, Gaza is this piece of land, and because it's controlled by Hamas, it's under blockade. So let's leave Gaza, have free trade. Obviously, the only party with which they're interested in having free trade would be Iran. Let's also leave the militias in Gaza be able to roam around Israel. After all, the blockade of Gaza is inhuman. What about here, the Golan Heights, right? The Golan Heights are occupied by Israelis. And I told you, they're of, very import of huge importance because it's the higher ground, and now that Israel occupies it, Syria cannot easily attack. Let's also return the Golan Heights to Syria because that would be fair, right? So this would mean that here in the Golan Heights, you'd have tanks by Assad, you could have a Russian army, maybe some Wagner mercenaries, because I know that these are the people who play ball in Syria. And what about the West Bank? Isn't it unfair to have an Israeli occupation there? So let's return the West Bank to the Palestinians, and let's also have free elections in the West Bank. Who would win this election? Hamas. So here, you would have a Hamas state with full sovereignty, which means it could invite revolutionary guards to do their practice shooting some miles away from Tel Aviv. It could also invite Russian artillery. I mean, it's a free it would be a free country, whatever. They can do whatever they want. This is what the left would consider a fair compromise. This is what the left is asking Israel to do. In other words, the only way for Israel to appease the left would be for Israel to commit suicide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I came late, but I listened to you on my earphone in my room. That uh, is very sweet. Thank you. Someone uh, told me he's listening to me in the gym, so... Yeah. yeah. Related to your topic, I wanted to recommend a book by Leon Uris. It's called The Hajj. The Hajj. H-A-J. It will give, and first, a fascinating book to read. It will give a history. It's completely not politically correct. Probably will not allow nowadays. And it will show more than what you just described about the background and uh, just highly recommended related to this uh, topic. Thank, Thank you. you very much. By the way, this is a topic that once you get into it, it's a rabbit, uh, it's a rabbit hole. It's, it's, it's very, very fascinating. And also, since the Soviet archives have opened and since the East Germany's archives opened, we've learned way more stuff. Nikos, thank you very much for that presentation. Very impressive. Thank you very much. Um, my question has to do with something I've heard other objectivists talk about, that the left will always eat its own. Mm -hmm. And it always seems like the people who are slightly left are going to get eaten by the people who are further left, who are going to get eaten by, you know, and so on and so forth. Can you speak to that? Because I'm, sure, I'm not married to the idea, but I can see how that is a possibility. Yeah, this can explain also why the Palestinian movement has turned more towards Islamism lately. Because the left proved inefficient. You know, they, they were willing to shoot children at point blank. They were not willing to blow up themselves. So you are right. Every time, every time in this conflict, we see that someone even darker and even, even more, how to put it, even more committed to destruction takes, uh, takes charge. So this is Hamas is actually appeal, that in a way they're purer. The Popular Front were secularists. They cared about 
cars, women, the good life in, when they would go to East Germany and have like their villas. Hamas is pure. It's literally a death cult. It's about destruction. That's it. I don't care if I die. I want to take as many Jews with me as possible. So yeah, what you're saying definitely makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a fairly recent college graduate. Um, that's loose. It was 2015. But I remember at the time it was very much pro-Palestinian. And arguments or facts presented otherwise were depicted as coming from conservative boogeymen, for lack of a better term, and dismissed offhand. It would be very difficult to um, change that perception. Um, I remember one classmate, actually, who is um, American Jewish, just talking about how terrifying Israel is with this military force. So my question is how to go about challenging that narrative in a way that's acceptable enough not to just get dismissed as a conservative boogeyman? That's a very good uh, question. I mentioned at some point that there were 20,000 Soviet officers and soldiers in Egypt. I believe that 20 intellectuals have done more damage to Israel than the 20,000 Soviet officers in Egypt. Because they've created exactly what you described, an atmosphere where if you dare to question that Israel is the bad guy, you are in, in academia, you are, you are a pariah. So what is the best way to fight this? The best way is facts. The best way is, okay, tell me, what happened in 1948? By the way, you'd be surprised how many people, like I grew up as a leftist wearing the Palestinian scarf. If you told me, point to me Israel in the map, I couldn't. If you tell me what happened in 1967, I'd say, I don't know. So you start with the facts. And then you go to the second question, which is, how do we choose sides, how do we choose sides here? Because I don't support Israel because I think the Jews, uh, you know, they should return to the promised land or whatever. The only reason I support it is because I compare. Here you have a country with a basic support for individual rights. Here you have a country with rule of law. In Israel, if you hear a knock on the door at night, it's probably your drunk neighbor. <laughs> in Arab countries, you hear a knock on the door at the night, you're ending up in the torture chamber. So this is my standard. This is how I decide with who I am. So on the one hand, what is the actual history? What did happen? What are the facts? And also, how do we evaluate it? What is the standard through which we decide in which side we are on? It's a very difficult battle. It's an uphill battle, particularly in academia. Thank you uh, very much. We have a question from Dennis. Yes. Shouldn't people who have the right to defend the rights of Palestinians, regardless of whether they are right or wrong? Can you repeat that? Should people? Shouldn't people have the right to defend the rights of Palestinians regardless of whether they are right or wrong. Well, you have the right to do whatever you want. We have free speech, but you'd be wrong. And that's the problem, by the way, then no matter what. Remember what we said about the underdog principle. The underdog principle says, you are weaker, I support you. And this is a crazy principle, by the way. Boko Haram is weak compared to, I don't know, the Nigerian army. Al-Qaeda was weak compared to the collective army of the world. The Bolsheviks were very weak, if you remember from my talk last year. What does it mean? We should support them because they're the underdogs? No. To the end of figuring out what the facts are, do you have a recommended reading list to understand this better? Oh. 15 or fewer books. <laughs> okay, let me say this. I will give you one book because it's the most balanced book I found on the topic. Now, balance doesn't mean, uh, no, both sides have a, balance is here are the facts and here are the, how they should be evaluated. It's a Lance Journos book, our colleague, What Justice Demands. And the reason I recommend it is because it's one by one it points out what are the, also the legitimate claims of the Palestinians. There were Palestinians who lost their land in 1948 without mistake of their own. 
There have been Palestinians in Western Bank who live under a regime of military occupation, which is a life which is not pleasant at all. So there are legitimate claims of some innocent Palestinians. The question is, who is to blame for this misery? The question is, what is to blame for this misery? So here's what I would suggest. Start with that. Start what justice demands. And if you want something more exciting in terms of following the historical fact, the most fascinating book I've read is by Stephen Pressfield, the guy who wrote The War of Art and Turning Pro. He wrote a book about the Six-Day War called The Lion Gate, if I can translate it right in my mind. And it's the most fascinating historical... It's somewhere between history and historical fiction, but it's the most fascinating history-related book I've ever read in my life. So Stephen Pressfield, The Lion Gate, it's about the Six-Day War. You feel like you're in the war. Like, first night, I was kind of jumping in my sleep, thinking like the Arabs are attacking. It's, 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 it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning. Good morning. The key phrase I keep hearing these days in the present is uh, apartheid state. Apartheid state. Apartheid state. And um, we have an evil uh, American congresswoman named Rashida Tlaib who keeps promoting this stuff and all that. But the thing is, like, sometimes I keep hearing about Israeli, what we call settlers, mm -hmm. going into Palestinian lands or neighborhoods and taking the, their, that land, the houses, throwing, them, throwing out the people and then taking the stuff and that the Israeli government would back them up, the settlers. But I don't know what's the truth or, or what. I don't, okay. or, and Rashida Tlaib is always going to tell you to support the BTS and all that. Yeah, this is a boycott, disinvest, and sanction. Okay, so when they talk about apartheid state, notice how they mix different things. Some people use it to describe the whole of Israel. Now, to describe Israel as apartheid state is a joke, and it's hubris to the actual apartheid. Israel is a country where Arabs actually serve in all positions of power. Some, they can even serve in the, in the army if they want. And it's a country where, again, if you are an Arab in the Middle East, like, you know what, how they were telling us the story where we come to Earth by a bird uh, when we are born? If you're in that bird, you should cross fingers, if you're an Arab, saying, please let me land in Israel. Arabs are better off in Israel than in any other Arab country. Now, they also use the term apartheid state for the, here, the so-called, the occupied territories. Now, what happened here? Again, in 1948, Jordan, occupied this territory, expelled every Jew from it, burned all the synagogues, and used it, used it as an attack front against Israel. So after 1967, Israel occupied it, and it still occupies it. And I explain to you why it still occupies it. Because if this were a sovereign state, this would be the destruction of Israel. So, the West Bank is under military occupation, indeed. And Arabs there, although many of them live under Palestinian authority, they don't live a life which is the life that I would want to live. But again, ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that so many times there have never been an agreement between who is the one who doesn't want a peaceful West Bank? Which ones are the groups who say, from the river to the sea, which again basically means throw the Jews to the sea. So no, I completely reject the idea of an apartheid state. If it is used for Israel, it's a joke. If it's used for the West Bank, it's using a term that knows that will arouse strong feelings on a context which is completely different. So I consider it an illegitimate uh, term. Thank you, Nikos, for a fabulous talk. Thank you. Uh, two things uh, I think it's important to mention. Uh, first, the terrorist attacks were a thing long before an is a real Israeli nationalist movement. We can mention uh, the riots of 1929. Of course. Uh, Arabs just murdered and expelled the whole Jewish population of Hebron. Um, and another thing, uh, who was the Palestinians or Arabs' best friend before the Soviet Union? Adolf Hitler. And who was the guest of honor 
uh, in Berlin who spent the whole war um, there and spoke at the radio and recruited volunteers to the SS from Bosnia, uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem. The Mufti, yeah. And actually, here's another interesting story. I mentioned to you the hijacking in 1956, which ended up in Operation Edebe, where the heroic Yoni Netanyahu, the brother of the current prime minister, died. Do you know why the radical leftists who did the hijacking chose Uganda? Uganda had a leader, Idi Amin, who was an open admirer of Hitler. Like, I'm not talking about, yeah, maybe the guy was not bad. He was a guy who openly declared that Hitler was great, and the only problem is he didn't kill all the Jews. And imagine the, the darkness and the hate in the mind of these people, the leftists. They hijack the airplane, they say, from all over the world, this is our guy. So it's in another interesting story. Have you heard of Carlos the Jackal? He's one of the most famous terrorists in history. He was a, Ven he's still alive in prison. He's a Venezuelan Marxist. Later in his life, his number one patron was a French super rich guy who was also an open Hitlerite anti-Semite. So their hatred for Israel was so big that they didn't have any problem to be bedfellows, these supposed radical leftists, bedfellows with open card-carrying Nazis. Uh, we have another question from Natalia. Could you comment on the Balfour Declaration issued by the British government in 1917 that made Jewish people move to Palestine despite the disagreement of the Arab uh, people? Okay, this would require another hour. To put it very, very, very simple, I told you when we talked about uh, the partition plan of 1948, 47, I told you that with this plan, the Jews were taking way less than what it was promised to them. The Balfour Declaration, which by the way, if it had went through, maybe, maybe we could have, many people who died in the Holocaust could have, would not have died, would actually say that the Jews would get almost the whole of this area. So this was the first attempt to establish a Jewish state after World War I. But the important information to maintain here is that it didn't happen, and this is why so many Jews who were fleeing Europe didn't have anywhere to go. I mean, there are tragic stories of boats that reach towards the Middle East, and then they have to make a U-turn and return to Europe. In terms of uh, who was there in the land, that's a lecture of its own. A land journal gave such a lecture in Enocon some years ago, Elan has given two Ocon talks on Israel. One of the two talks a lot about that period, so I would recommend to our friend to check it out. Thank you. I often hear people say that the Palestinian people don't want this. They just want peace, that it's all Hamas and Israel. However, when the Twin Towers fell, or when Israeli civilians are killed in a terrorist attack, you can find videos of them dancing in the street, handing out food, and cheering. Should we make efforts to push back against this notion of a largely peaceful Palestinian populace, or should we tolerate it while focusing our efforts on denouncing Hamas and other regimes that are more directly responsible for this conflict? This is so difficult to answer because my heart goes to the Palestinians who actually want peace. And their biggest enemy is in the West Bank, the PLO, and in Gaza, Hamas, because they don't accept any, dis any dissent. And actually, if they believe that you're even sympathetic to Israel, horrible things are going to happen to you. So the quick answer is we, don't, we cannot know how many Palestinians are really yearning for peace. What we do know, though, is that in the one time in Gaza that there were elections, Hamas won. And experts in the area believe that if there were free elections in West Bank, Hamas would also win in West Bank. Now, we don't know because we haven't seen this. So it's very, very difficult. Can you put a label in a whole population? For me, it's very difficult to do so. But there is a reason to believe that many of these people are in accordance with the ideas of Hamas. And again, the ideas of Hamas is not peace. The ideas of Hamas is destruction. And then after destruction, even war stuff is on board for the locals. Because what comes then on board is something like the regime that Iran has. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. But what confuses me is why so many American Jews 
support and vote for the left. Can you yes. offer any explanation? Because as we said, this morality that tells you that the suffering deserves your support is not unique to the left. Actually, this morality doesn't even come from the left. And this morality is so embedded in our psyche, in our society psyche, that these people, I don't know, I cannot psychologize, but I guess, they're saying, if I want to be a good person, I have to support the weak side there. And here's an extra bonus. I will support the weak side against, quote, my people. So self-sacrifice in steroids. So I'm supporting the weak. Oh, and these weak are my enemies, so now I'm double honorable, so to speak. Again, this is psychologizing. But I cannot find any other explanation. Like, I, will, I honestly ask this question. How can you be, how can you care about Palestinians and support Arafat, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the 50 different popular and democratic fronts? I cannot find any other explanation. Thank you. Hello. Thank Hello. you for a great talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to clarify something. You've said the motive was envy, right? Now, envy, for most people, you think of, oh, they wish they had the restaurants, the, the buildings, the, the um, startups. But, but that's not quite what you have in mind. I, I assume you yes. have in mind Ayn Rand's conception of envy. You're very right. Isn't, isn't right. As, as hatred of the good for being the good. They don't want the prosperity of Israel, they want Israel to die. And that's uh, just to clarify. That's very important. The way, and thank you for bringing this up, the way Ayn Rand means envy is not what we said, the Arabs stepping up. It's not the Arabs also having the industry, the entrepreneurial drive, the startups. It's not the Arabs having them, but Israel not having it anymore. I will leave you with one line from a very, very good TV series on the topic. The TV series is Fauda. There is one Palestinian operative, his Fatah, so relatively these days, relatively more moderate, who has kind of has a change of heart and sees what has actually happened there. And he takes his young, idealistic, idealistic mean fanatic son, somewhere close to the beaches of Israel, and he shows him the skyscrapers, and he shows him the big kind of achievements of Israel, and he tells him, here's the reason why I will never be able to defeat them, because they want to live. So envy is not, we also want to live. Envy is, I recognize these people want to live, and I don't want them to live. Thank you.